And we're back with more of the Pope on film. Yes, I'm awake. I'm awake. It's time, buddy! It's time. It is time. It is goddamn time. Yes, buddy, my friend who is more than brother to me, I embrace thee. Because it is time once again for all of us here at the Pope on Film Podcast to electric slide, woogie woogie woogie, our way into the second half of our big shoe. And it is said second half wherein we finally and eventually get around to discussing our all new digitally remastered director's cut. And now with the long lost alt- alternate ending where Charlie Bucket is shot to death by British police. Movie of the week! And this week, we continue our slow march towards our final episode with the look, with a look at the 2024, A24, egg-breaking horror drama, I Saw the TV Glow! Give me some dramatic music, buddy. Dun, 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 dun. That was good. Uh the 2024 A24 egg breaking horror drama. I saw the TV glow. Funny, do you know what egg breaking means? What what breaking? Do you know what egg breaking means? Uh make an omelet? No. That's what this movie is all about. So your gender is an egg. And eventually the egg cracks and you realize that you were not the gender that you were given at birth. And so your gender is an egg. Ogres are onions. Your gender is an egg. And a lot of times a specific thing will break your egg. Okay. And that's what this movie is about. Because um, my egg started getting cracked when Johnny Depp played Ed Wood. But okay. it was it wasn't until 2019 that I saw Midsommar that that egg got fucking smashed. Yeah. And I now realize that that was the beginning of my road directly towards transitioning. Because while everyone else saw that movie and was like, man, this is a fucked up movie. I saw uh, Danny, the May Queen, finally being free of the life that she hated and now having a new life with a new family. And I wanted to be the May Queen in Midsommar and get oh, all I of remember. my problems and my gender and put it in that fucking pyramid and set it on fire. And that is what I did. And so that's what this movie is about. Is that it how is you it... see Midsommar now? Yeah. That is fucking yeah. interesting. Midsommar to me is a movie about a, a trans woman. And what she does is she, it, Christian represents her. Christian and Danny are the same person. She gets I, rid of yeah, Christian. Yeah, 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 yeah. And she I see where Danny. you're going. Yeah. Go, go, on, it's go. Exactly, on. It's exactly what I did. I got my gender. Yeah. I put it in a bear. Yeah. I put the bear in a pyramid. I set the pyramid on fire. And now I get to live a happy life as the May Queen. That's what this movie is about. Except for this person, what started the egg cracking was. The pink opaque. Yes. So before we get to any of that, which is which is very much based on, or at least has the same vibe in a lot of ways as Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Yes, in fact, I looked it up on Wikipedia. The mom of the kid. Yeah. That it. Is Tara? Is that it? Yeah, I was Buffy sitting here. I was Square? sitting here watching the movie, and I was like, "Holy fuck, is that Tara?" Because yeah, now a lot of it, years have gone by. 
she looks like oh, wow. somebody's mom. Yeah. And yeah, I um, had to go look her up. And god damn it, yes, it is. Did you look up anybody else who might be in this movie? Uh no. Not really. <laughs> okay. So the cameos in I Saw the TV Glow are very set to they're a part of what the movie is about. So Tara, who is a lesbian in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, is a mom in this movie. That makes sense. So I want you to keep this in mind when I tell you that the main character's dad yeah. was played by Fred Durst, the lead singer of Limp Fucking Biscuit. Yeah, I, 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 I briefly saw that. It just didn't, you know, I was just like, yeah, whatever. I didn't, I didn't much care. Yeah, Fred Durst is in this movie. And at first I'm like, what the fuck is Fred Durst doing? But 1996 kind of was his year. Yeah. He, he was doing a great job in 96. Not so much now. But anyway, let me do some stats. This is a 2024 movie. It's newish. It, it began slowly rolling out in theaters in May, which wasn't that long ago. It was written, produced, and directed by Jane Schoenbrunn. This is her third film after a trippy and little scene film called We're All Going to the World's Fair and a documentary about Slenderman. Okay. In fact, Jane Schoenbrunn is working on a trilogy that she's calling the Screen Trilogy because uh, the movie World's Fair, Let's All Go to the World's Fair, it's about the internet. And okay. that's the first film in the screen trilogy. And then I saw the TV glow is about TV. And she the third part of the screen trilogy will be a collection of three novels entitled Public Access Afterworld. Okay. And I don't know what that means, but also, I could see Purgatory being a public access television show. You could see what I being feel a like, public access? I, I might have lost the thread. Um, I could see <laughs> pub, a public access TV show being Purgatory. Oh, okay. Like, the back rooms seems like the back rooms is where everyone films public access television shows. Yeah. I totally see that. Also, Jane Schoenbrunn is trans femme and non-binary. According to Waika Padaya, they realized they were trans after doing shrooms in 2019. And if I may take a short aside here, I I've never taken mushrooms. Yeah, I, they're on my bucket I've heard, list. I I've heard they do wonders for PTSD, pitist, and I've got a lot of pitist. Yeah, so I really want to try and get my hands on some. But anyway, um, so let me talk to you about this film, funny. Uh, Wikipedia had this to say. Okay? I'm going to be reading from Wikipedia here. Okay. Gender identity and dysphoria are prominent themes in Schoenbrunn's work. Uh, <clears throat> they have frequently described I Saw the TV Glow as a film about the egg crack, a term for the moment in a trans person's life when they realize their identity does not correspond to their assigned gender. Additionally, Schoenbrunn has described the presence of screens, which are fe frequently featured in their work as, quote, a metaphor for the ways in which we don't experience ourselves when we're going through dysphoria and coming to terms with transness. And I understand that, especially after, like, I got into Ed Wood so much, I made a religion about him. <coughs> yes, yes, you did. 
And then I, I, and then it was Midsommar that truly, like the egg, the cracks began to show with my lifelong obsession with Ed Wood, but the cracking really happened thanks to Midsommar. Um, as a trans person, um, this film was an important film for me because the film is really about being trans and gender dysphoria, gender dysphoria and egg breaking. And sometimes I do get a bad case of gender dysphoria, if I'm being real honest. I've gotten better now at waking up and looking in the mirror. And I just woken up and I took edibles to sleep. So I've got cotton mouth like crazy. Yeah. And I haven't shaved and no makeup and my hair's a mess. And I look in the mirror and I can see a woman. Yeah. For the longest time it was, oh my God. I look like a man. I need to work on making myself into a woman. Now, I'm just a woman. I have reached a comfortable spot in my transition where, and this is an absolute possibility, if tomorrow the fucking assholes in the Republican Party took away all of my medication and stopped me from uh, medically transitioning, I'd still be a woman. Yeah. This is just who I am now. But uh, there there were a number of times where I would look in the mirror, my screen, my TV glow, and I would see my father laughing at me. Okay. Especially the first year that I identified as a woman. Because the first year that I identified as a woman, it was all about safety and paranoia. And I've got to pass. I've got to pass. I absolutely yeah. have to pass. I'm in the Midwest. I'm in the Bible Belt. I'm in a small town. I'm I am already putting my life on the line by saying I am trans. And so I've got to pass. I've got to work really hard. i got to watch YouTube videos, makeup tutorials. I've got to get a bunch of women's clothes, more women's clothes, a, ones that'll make me pass. And and i, I got to borrow some clothes from my wife. Let's be honest here. Uh, steal some clothes from my wife. Take some clothes, liberate yes. some clothes from my wife. That's better. And uh, I've got to work on my voice. I've got to work on my feminine voice. I've got to tilt my head a little more than I normally do because a lot of women do that. I got to start playing with my hair more. I got to be more gesture more with my hands. I've got to pay attention to how women dress, how women walk. I need to pass. I need to pass. I need to pass. But now, though, three years into my transition, like, I've never really been attacked. I've never really, like, I'm fine. I feel like I'd be attacked more if I still lived in California. Yeah. But I'm fine, and I'm out as a trans woman, and everybody knows it, and I'm fine with it, but... There were parts of this film that spoke very deeply to me. Yeah, where? As a trans tell me, woman. tell me, educate me here. I love this uh, movie, but now from my perspective, like I don't know when it dawned on me that he was a trans woman, but it did. And it, dude, but I found the, it all very subtle leading up to that point, where it sounded yeah. like you didn't find it damn near as subtle. No, fuck no. The when he's doing the parachute at school, it's the trans colors. It's a trans flat. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That, so, that missed. But, yeah, I didn't yeah. get that bit. Yeah, it's an actual trans flag, and everyone's just sitting there and they're playing. But he's the one who like stands up and he's looking and he walks into the middle of it, and you see the trans colors right there. Then there's the fact that like, oh, like every A twenty four film, this is like neoned to death, but mostly he is in blue. Yeah, because you know, 
the whole film is about his egg. And yeah, I I understood. Hey, here's this thing. Here's this piece of media. Here's this piece of pop culture in some way. And I want to get into it. But also I'm scared of my dad. Yeah. Who is who he, my father was very strict on. Um, he was really into beating cishet heteronormative into me so I understood the fear when I was like in junior high and high school I would go to the mall steal cassette singles cuss singles as they were called from female artists because I know I can't ask my parents for money to buy music from a female artist because female artists they're for girls and I'm a guy and so I can't listen to it so I would get like <clears throat> I would take like Madonna, um, Wilson Phillips, Paula Abdul, and then I'd wait for my family to be gone, my parents to be gone. I would lock the door and I would listen to uh, music by women and I would dance. So I absolutely understand like, oh, this show, I want to watch it, but I know I cannot. And the dad says, isn't that a show for girls? I yeah, 100% know that. I get that. I understand that. And I I don't think I would have gotten um, realizing gender through a medium of pop culture is it, if it wasn't for the fact that now I'm on the other side and I'm trans. And oh, yeah, Midsommar did that for me. Yeah. Midsommar was my pinko paint. This film is a direct allegory to trans identity without ever actually fucking saying it. And I really like it. But here's the thing, Bunny. Real talk. Honest. Uh, confession time. Hello. My name is Mei Lin. I have never seen an episode of Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Seriously? Ever. Never saw it. I saw the original movie with Christy Swanson. Yeah. And I thought that it was kind of fun. But no, I never saw. I never saw Buffy the Vampire Slayer. And when I was talking to my wife about this movie. She said, so you never saw Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Why didn't you see it back then? And it's like, it was popular. And everybody yeah. loved it. So I pushed it away from me. Yeah. And also, I felt like it was for girls. So fucking, I might have to start watching Buffy. You might have to. I'm a to. little bit late. It, to it, the... <sighs> TV now and TV shows now are really more about myth building and carrying a particular theme throughout a whole season. Yeah. And it makes TV now much more interesting, I think, but not nearly as rewatchable. Yeah. You know, older shows like Star Trek, you could watch the fucking Troubles for Tribbles for the rest of your fucking life. You know what I mean? Yeah, I saw some article online, and I don't remember where I saw it, but um, it basically was talking about how now that every TV show has a season comprising of six episodes that will take like two years to make. Yeah. Um, no longer are there filler episodes. Yeah. Back when you had 24 episodes to do, so one of them, someone stuck in a fucking elevator. Yeah. But from one how, of them, clip show. Yeah. But from how, how I see this, it seemed to have transitioned at the, same, at the same point with both the X-Files and Buffy the Vampire Slayer, starting yeah. as a regular... Uh, you know, monster of the week kind of a thing. Yeah. You know? Like the beginning of Supernatural was the same way. Right. And then as you get seasons into it, now it is more 
lore. Episodic and lore and their myth and yeah. And it's Yeah, that's it's what I was thinking when better, I was talking to but not as rewatchable I find. Yeah, when I was talking to Natasha about maybe finally watching Buffy the Vampire Slayer, one of the things that got me was I don't know if I can get through the first three seasons where there's no lore. Where it's just Monster of the Week, and then eventually they get to like actual characterization and lore and world building and all that. Well, well no, there's character building, of course. You yeah. know. Just like on any other show. But come and on. Remember the, when, the, the, remember the when Slender Man comes from Buffy. Watch the gentleman episode. You know what I think is the problem with America? There are no more musical episodes. Buffy had a musical episode? Yep, Buffy had a musical episode. Scrubs had a musical episode. Uh, TV but shows need to... the movie. Where, where's the Breaking Bad musical episode? I would have watched the shit out of that. Back to the movie. What else did you see? Does House have a musical episode? You don't know? Okay. Um. This film is set in 1996. Oh, and even back to the movie, though. Even that that bar that they met in later. Yeah. Where we found out she worked at Build-A-Bear. Like, Hot Topics wasn't fucking hiring. But anyway, that was more or less the bronze from Buffy the Vampire Slayer, the club that they all hung out as. Right. You know, so they they were so like... Maybe they did that for the rest of us. <laughs> Maybe. So, um, funny. This it, a good portion of this film was set in 1996, and funny. You know, a lot happened in the year 1996. Let's talk about it. What was the top movie of the year? 96. You'll never guess it. Fighting too hard to survive. We were in Binghamton at the time. Let me tell you what the top movie of the year 1996 was. Of course, America had Mary Riley fever. Everyone loved Mary Riley. You'd see people lining up and seeing it like five or six times in a row. America was Mary Riley obsessed. Now the biggest bomb of the year, Independence Day. You mean to tell me that this is an alien movie starring the Fresh Prince of Bel-Air and Taxi's Judd Hirsch? Yeah. Nobody saw Independence Day. It, everyone had Mary Riley fever. Um, Braveheart won Oscars. And of course, in Mel Gibson's acceptance speech for Best Picture and Best Director, he famously said, I'd like to thank all of the Jews in my life. Yeah. For whom I'll never have an issue with. Yes. Ever. You know who Time, you know who People Magazine's hottest man, sexiest man alive was in 1996? Of course you do. Ted Kaczynski. Okay. He really exploded onto the scene in 96. He had a real, uh, Cottagecore vibe. Well, you know, it's it's the air of mystery, you know? Like, yeah. you see all the sketches of him with the hoodie, and it's closed down over his face, and he can barely... You, 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 just, you just can't help but thinking, like, man, what's Mystique. under that hood? Exactly. What are exactly. we going to see once we pull that foreskin back? <laughs> In the year 1996, Jim Carrey was paid $20 million to star in the movie The Cable Guy. And I'm just going to be really honest, I still don't know why. I, there's a movie I've yet to see. I, I've never been, that big of, never been that big of a fan. Oh, the no, only Jim thing Carrey that I like, the only thing I liked about The Cable Guy is that Jim Carrey, in his Jim Carreyist, sang a cover of the song Somebody to Love. Okay. And anytime I hear that song, I think of Jim Carrey and the Cable Guy. But beyond that, I don't give a shit. 
And of course, the biggest news of 1996 was uh, the tragic news that we all remember when uh, rapper Tupac Shakur was murdered by police after killing John Benet Ramsey. Yeah. They had a long beat, you know, because Tupac was East Coast. John Benet Ramsey, she was doing uh, beauty pageants in the West Coast. So yeah. it really was an East Coast, West Coast sort of thing. Anyway, John Benet Ramsey released a diss track. Tupac killed her, and then Tupac was killed by the police, and then they covered it up. It's very sad. Uh, and also in 1996, I had just started college. And here's a fun fact. Here's a fun fact. Uh, I was going to Arizona State University, which is in Tempe, Arizona. It's right there on Mill Avenue. Mill Avenue and University Avenue were like the centers of the college. And they had coffee shops and, you know, uh, uh, drug paraphernalia places and just cool places where you could get some food. And there were nightclubs and you could hang out. And there was a big movie theater. A Harkins movie theater. And I spent so much time there in 94 and 95 and 96 and 97 and 98 and 99. I spent so much time at that one specific Harkins movie theater on Mill Avenue. You know who worked there at the time? Ten minute warning. You know who worked there at the time? Who? A young Bill Hader. Stefan from SNL. He worked at that uh, Harkins movie theater in 95 and 96 and 97. He was fired in 1997 after ruining the ending of the movie Titanic for a bunch of sorority girls. Okay. That's true. So I spent so much time at that movie theater in Tempe, Arizona that there is no way that I did not run into Bill Hader. Yeah. That's really weird to me. They're like, holy shit. There is a, there is a 95% chance that at one point in time, Stefan served me popcorn. Yeah. Yeah. That's fucking insane. So anyway, bunny, uh, this week's movie did have me at age 24, but besides that, I was fresh out of high school in 1996. At the time, I was regularly dressing as a woman, and I had to hide it because my dad was really into beating uh, cishet heteronormativity into me. I understand the fear yeah. that the lead character of this week's movie felt about... Um, Honestly, I really related to this film. At times, it felt like I was painfully watching embarrassing home videos of myself. Okay. All trans people have parts of their life like this, I honestly believe. Where the the thing that, that touched me the most, number one, the finale, but we'll get to that. And number two... This movie does a great job of showing how it felt before I transitioned. Yeah. An isolation and a fear and knowing that that something is wrong with you, but you don't know what's wrong with you and neither does anybody else. And so you find yourself in a position where you're not living your life, your life is kind of being lived for you and you're watching it. And you don't realize it, but you have created a persona to sort of get you through existence. And you're not so much being yourself as you're playing a part, but you won't know that until the egg finally cracks and you get onto the other side. But I fully understood what it felt to sort of find yourself in bits of pop culture. And that's why this is all about the egg break. And it really uh, touched me in that way. You don't realize that you are not you. 
Yeah. And uh, six minutes. Okay. Mm. Also, Connor O'Malley is in this. He's his boss at like the family right, I mean, fun but center. That's the part. Sorry. But, and the, he was but in, that's the part and, that I I can't relate to. You know what I mean? Like, because yeah. I've just never had anything in my experience like that. This is me, good or worse. Yeah. You know? Yeah. No, it, it, yeah. It, I don't look like I'm hiding both, shit. <laughs> both Q and I saw this, both Q and I, before we saw this movie together, we saw reviews, I saw reviews, of I saw the TV globe by, like, straight white people saying, I just want to give all trans people a hug. I get it now. I understand. But I didn't see that at all. When I saw this film, I said, okay, this film will really say something to trans people, but for everyone else, yes. I hope they like it. Not nearly as much. Right. It, for for, yeah. for non-trans people, not nearly as much. That's why... That's why I want to hear more about what you say about the movie for all the weird little shit like the egg breaking or the glow of the TV that uh, that went right by me. Yeah. Um, I'm sure a lot of I, this movie went right by me, but it was still a very understand. enjoyable A24 road to go down. Yeah. I had to bury myself in order for me to live. So I understood the whole, here is this person, and this person knows that you are different, so come with me, and I will help you, and I will bring you there, and eventually he's just too scared. And that I really related to, because I was scared to medically transition, and then something happened to me at the end of 2021 and the beginning of 2022, which caused me to say, hey, now that I've survived this horrible thing, I'm not scared of a lot of things. And I started transitioning and I feel so much different than I did before. And so I absolutely understood, hey, I buried myself underground and came back out and it was a struggle, but now I'm better for it. Yeah. And he's scared of it. The biggest thing, it, the ending scared the shit out of me. Because a number of times, as Mei Lin, as the trans woman that I am, I have visited Barnes & Noble bookstores, and I have gone in and heard the music and seen the displays and looked at the employees and said, this is the most boring fucking job in the fucking world. <laughs> and there is no way that I could stay here as a trans woman. So seeing him too scared to transition, staying who he pretends to be, and being stuck 40-something years old, still working at the uh, family amusement center. Yeah. I do not want to see myself as a 50-year-old man covering nine breaks at the bookstore. Yeah. That ending scared the shit out of me. And I, it, it, it really talked to me specifically because I had to bury myself in order for me to live. Going from Steve to Mei Lin in the 10 years that we have done this show, the best way that I can describe it is what fucking Brad Pitt goes through an interview with a vampire. You're living your life. Your life is okay. But it's not until you get bitten and you look at things with vampire eyes that you realize, oh, my God. Yeah. This is actually amazing. So you have to have the courage. Uh, the egg breaks, and then what are you going to do with it? So you've got to put it together, and I made an omelet. Yeah. And if you'd like to learn more about egg breaking, just watch this week's movie. I saw the TV glow from yeah. 2024. And, and it, I it also, does a great job. I also walked into this just dead cold. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, all I knew was the name of the movie, and it was an A24 movie. And, frankly, that's all you really need to know. At first, when I was watching the movie, I'm like, okay, so it's 1996, okay. 
How am I supposed to know it's 1996? Why don't you, the film, show me it's 1996? Because I don't see anything here that is different from, holy shit, that's a Fruitopia vending machine. <laughs> we are in 1996, people. Fruitopia. <laughs> so that was good. Also, Fred Durst is in this. And this speaks directly to trans people in an amazing way. But that's all I've got for this week's film. I love it. It's going to be on my list of my favorite movies of the year. And we have been talking a lot about gender and gender identity. And I have one more week to pick movies. And so I am doing my last ever double feature. We are continuing this week's discussion in the next episode where we will be watching and discussing Ed Wood and Midsommar. Oh, we're going to rewatch them both, okay? Yes. And it's going to be about more about my gender identity than about Ed Wood and Midsommar, but we'll have fun. So that's the next episode. Now that I'm looking back at this episode, the highs, the lows, the ups, the downs, Fred Durst, uh, the Star Wars candy where you made out with Jar Jar Vase, Sacramentos, Las Palmas, Johnny Rockets. I got to say, I think this has been a pretty good episode of podcast. It has been a damn good episode. Okay, I I concur with your assessment 